come to grace. Why don't we stand and worship tonight together? Let's sing. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. Sing, I believe. I believe in signs and wonders. Yeah. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over. My name is registered in heaven. Yeah. And my praise belongs to you forever. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yeah. Anybody thankful tonight? Together, sons and daughters, bought with blood, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Yes, our God will finish what He started. This is my testimony. Grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's sing this together. If I'm not dead, you're not done. Thank you, Jesus. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Sing it with us. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Yeah, sing it out. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Things are still to come. Oh, I believe this is my testimony. Let me hear you from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Cause I'm alive. This is my testimony. sound good tonight psalm 104 says enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise what does that mean to enter into god's presence we can give him thanks and praise and he'll meet us that's what that means so we're going to do something a little bit different tonight right where you're at let's just give him thanks with our own words from our own heart you can sing it you can say it, but just say, thank you, Jesus, for the breath in my lungs. Just lift it up all of the room. Thank you, Jesus. You are good. You are great. Oh, we magnify your name, Jesus. Come on, lift it up tonight. Don't let us just sing it. You sing it. Lift it up.
God, thank you. God, thank you, Lord Jesus, for that story we just sang about in that song. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. God, thank you for your presence. Thank you for this opportunity to meet tonight, Lord Jesus. We love you. Everybody said, amen. Well, why don't you turn to somebody next to you and say, welcome to church. We're so glad you're here. Good evening, everybody. It's good to see you. Glad that you're here tonight. Hey, if you will, real quick, pull out your bulletins. I just want to highlight a couple of things here before we continue on with tonight. First off, if you're newer around here, we welcome you. You're always welcome to come be a part of our services, our small groups. We have outreaches, so many things that are happening around here. Make sure you take us up on it and see what's going on. A couple of easy ways to interact with us if you'd like to. There's a uh, welcome or a connect card right here in your seats or up in the balcony or online or e- e- here as well. You can text the word connect and it's an easy way to interact with us. We'll uh, answer your questions that you have about Jesus, about church, why we do what we do. Maybe you have a prayer request, you can put that on there as well. We'd love to pray for you and anything that you're, you're going through. And then at the end of the service, you can take that connect card and drop it off at any of our uh, offering boxes on the way out. It's the way we give our tithes and offerings. You can see that there. Also, just on the back, you know, there's lots of different small groups that are happening, easy ways to get connected. But I want to highlight a a couple here. The the top right is the prepare for the marriage more than the wedding. This is our grace to love. We do this several times a year. One of our pastors, Marty, he leads this, been doing it for many years. This is an absolutely must to have strong, healthy marriages. So if you're thinking about getting married, or you're already married, it's not too late. You could jump in and do it then as well. But for those that are definitely planning on getting married, it's an absolute must that you have to go through this. You'll thank me for it. You won't regret it. It'll strengthen and encourage you, I I promise you. So look at the details there and check that out. And also there at the bottom with our Discover Grace classes, our Sunday schools on on Sunday mornings at 9 a.m., all, we post all of that online for our Sunday schools with the, the material, the audio of it. Make sure that you're taking advantage of that. Our, our heart is to have a church that's rooted and grounded in the Scriptures, to know what the, really, what the Bible really says, so don't miss out on that. And those that are, uh, that are interested in membership are Discover Grace classes, four classes that run. We do it every single month. You can see the details there as well. You can do that online. You can come and do it in person. And it's more than just becoming a member. We look at these Discover Grace classes as as ways to really find out how you are uniquely gifted and and created by the Lord to be a blessing to the church and to to do what God has called you to do. We cover all of that in the, the Discover Grace classes. And one more thing, this is real important. Those of you that live in St. Charles, You have an election coming up on Tuesday voting for who your mayor is going to be. And we happen to have one of the candidates that have, Tom Besselman, that has been a a part of Grace Church for many, many, many years, that's actually going to be on the ballot for running for mayor for St. Charles City. And I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, but I will tell you to vote for God-fearing people that commit their lives to the Bible. And I happen to know that Tom is one of those guys. Just going to say that. Well, let's pray, and then we're going to get right to it. We have an incredible guest. So, Lord, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for church. We thank you for today and the freedom to assemble. Lord, tonight, would you give us ears to hear? In the name of Jesus, amen. Okay, Grace Church, I need your help. I need you to give a profoundly warm welcome to Bishop E.W. Jackson. Bishop, come and join us this evening. Come on now, just a little bit more, a little bit more. I'm telling you. They know you, man. They know you. How how many of the men, how many of the men were here this morning? Gosh, no wonder. Yeah, I mean, seriously. I think that was one of the most rallying men's meetings I think I've ever been to in my life. And I'm not saying that as an exaggeration. We're going to post it for everybody to be able to hear that. It was life-giving. Yeah. I mean, we're standing around afterwards. Nobody wanted to leave talking about, man, he gave us 
You didn't just give us truth. You gave us faith. I mean, Praise the, the God. faith God. comes by hearing the truth, and it was, it was real. So I just finished your book this week, and it's, it's relatively new, right? I mean, this yes. is just right Came off. out on the 18th of January. Yep. In fact, he did not bring enough. The men's ministry almost They've cleaned, cleaned you out. out already. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, so you are going to be around to sign some books. I'll be tonight. signing some tonight. There may not be any left for tomorrow, but we'll, we'll figure that out and figure tell people out. where they can get them. Yeah, we're going to figure out how to get everybody this book because I'm telling you, he covers it all. His story is epic in terms of God just demonstrating through his life that, that the gospel changes everything. Yes, it does. And uh, I, I mean, I am so looking forward to this this weekend. We actually had our drummer hand us a video of, of this man, and we were going to try to show some little clips of it and ended up showing 50 minutes of the whole thing on a weekend, <laughs> and it went viral. And then he ends up, on Jason Whitlock's show and some other things as a result of this. So it's like, just, I mean. It was almost like he was meant to be here. It was so. absolutely <laughs> a God, for being here. God thing. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. <laughs> but yeah, so pray for him and yeah. man, we wanna turn you and, loose. And I wanna say this too, so you're here tonight, so thank you for being here, but he's also doing a unique message in the morning, a whole different message tomorrow at 10 o'clock as well. So come back tomorrow at 10 to hear a different message. And we message. will make the men's ministry, because it, it, it was for everybody. It was for everybody, and we're gonna make that available as well. All right, so be able to hear So let's package. pray, yeah. we're gonna cut him loose. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. Yes, amen. Lord, our prayer tonight is that, number one, that you would anoint your servant. We thank you, we receive him. Jesus. And Lord, give us ears to hear. Provoke us, encourage us, move us. God, we thank you for Bishop Jackson. We ask you to bless him and his family and his word tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you. you man. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Wes. God bless you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for the encouragement, but let me just say for the record, to God be the glory for the things that he has done. For with his love he saved me and by his power he raised me to God be the glory for the things that he has done. And I say, Lord, just let me live my life. Let it be pleasing unto thee. And if I gain any praise, let it go to Calvary. For with his love he saved me by his power he raised me to God be the glory for the things that he has done. You know, I always say, what I am, he made me. What I have, he gave me. Where I am, he brought me. And what I know, he taught me. To God be the glory for the things that he has done. Well, it's been a wonderful time. We really enjoyed ourselves this morning. And thank Ron and Wes and this great congregation for your hospitality and your warmth. Really appreciate you. Yeah, I did make a mistake. I didn't bring enough books. We thought we were bringing plenty, but as it turns out, we probably will not have enough. I'll be signing books tonight, and that may be the end of the hard copy books I brought. But you will still be able to get books uh, in a couple of ways. My publisher, you can get them wherever books are sold, of course. My publisher uh, text uh, uh, website is faithfultext.com. And I don't, we may have that on a, be able to put that up on the screen, but faithfultext.com. And because it's my publisher with no middleman, 15% off of the retail price of the book there. But for those of you who decide you want to support us on an ongoing basis, my organization stands, staying true to America's national destiny, which I'll talk a little bit more about tomorrow. Um, you can do that and get a free book uh, by signing up as a Patriot Partner, we call it, Patriot Partner, with a minimum of $25 a month contribution to us. I'll send you a signed, numbered copy of the books. Those books are signed by me and numbered, so you know exactly which number book you are getting uh, because they're coming from my personal stash. So we're doing that for people who sign up to be Patriot Partners and support our work on an ongoing basis. But thank you so much for receiving the book so well. We do have a couple of boxes left, and we will make those available to you tonight. 
and then tomorrow we will have to refer people to the website uh, or to get them online. And by the way, the ones you get online will not be signed by me, but if you get them through our organization, I will sign the book uh, personally for you. I want to acknowledge Debbie. I just, you know, I always say you can, you can figure out why a man is successful quite quickly once you meet his wife. So I had a chance to meet Debbie warm and friendly and loving. And I tell people all the time, I, I know I would not be where I am had it not been for my wife. I've been married for 52 years. Um, and I say that's one of the best decisions I ever made. Uh, second only to receiving Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. So uh, my wife would love to be here, but we started a school uh, about three years ago called the Maximum Potential Christian Academy, uh, trying to help these young people get a, 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 a vision for life that is beyond what government schools are going to teach them and beyond what the mainstream media and the popular culture is going to teach them. And my wife is dedicated to that, devoted to it, and she likes to stay there and prepare curriculum and do things for these young people. I told her, I said, I thought when you retired from teaching at public schools, you were going to be traveling with me. And she said, well, I did too, but the Lord had a different plan. So she brings you greetings, however, and I trust that if you ever have me back, I'll be able to bring her with me so that you can meet my lovely wife. We now have one grandchild uh, who was born. She will be, will be celebrating her first uh, birthday on March the 8th, and I'll tell you, I've told people, if you thought I was a warrior before, now that I've got my first grandchild, look out, because I am defending her right to grow up in a country that is prosperous and free and at peace and that really blesses the American people. So, all right, well, let me get to what the Lord has given me to do. I want to call your attention to a scripture tonight, just one verse. It's in Romans eleven twenty nine, And I use the New King James Version, but it reads essentially the same as the Old King James. It says, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. And I want to pose a question to you tonight. What will you do with the gift? What will you do with the gift? In my home, in one of our guest bedrooms, sits a desk. That desk is literally almost 60 years old, I think 59 years old in some months. And it's not an antique, it's nothing special, uh, doesn't have any particular provenance to it. But if someone were to break into my house and try to do something to that desk, they would have a fierce warrior on their hands. Because I was born into a broken home. At the age of 14 months old, I was placed in foster care in the home of Willie and Rebecca Mollett, who were illiterate people. Willie could not read at all and could not write at all. He made an X for his name. Rebecca, my foster mother, could read a little, but just write her name and, and a little bit, but say, well, they were both illiterate. And I was placed in their home at the age of 14 months old. By the time... I was 10, I had become a bitter young man. I was mad. Where's my mother? Where's my father? See, my friends are with their mother. They're with their father. How come I can't be with mine? Barely knew my mother because she was caught up with the Watchtower and Awake Society. And I literally, literally would see my mother standing in front of a store and stop, and she would wave at me but would not leave her post to come and speak to her son. My father visited me, and I knew who he was. I called my foster mother mom because I didn't begin to call my real mother mom until I was 
15, 16 years old because I just didn't know her. I called her by her first name. And I kind of made the conscious decision to call her mom. But my foster mother, I called her mom because she was the only mother that I really knew. By the age of 10 years old, I was a member of a gang. We were having gang fights, and thank God we weren't using guns or knives, but they were vicious. We were defending our territory, the Pennell Street Gang and the Eagles. One of the members of our gang, a young man named Herman Cooper, went to jail for committing murder, murdered another friend of mine named Rabbit at a party. They got into it, and he shot Rabbit dead. The people that we admired were convicts. People had been to the penitentiary, and we literally... It shows the pathology that sets in when young people don't have the proper guidance because my foster parents could not control me and our, our admiration went to the people who had been to the penitentiary because when they came out, they were tough and they were rough and everybody respected them and everybody got out of the way as they walked down the street and we wanted to be like them one day. We would rob milk trucks because the SEAL tests... Uh, 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 a milk truck company was positioned at a place where we could get over the fence and go from truck to truck. We would go up on porches and look for valuables and, and rob people. In other words, we were really on our way. We were committing what at that point were petty crimes, but we were really on our way. We were ready to graduate to something bigger. And one day standing on the corner of 3rd and Pennell Street, with my gang in front of Madeline's supermarket. I will never forget it. My father pulled up, rolled down the window of his car, pointed his finger at me and said, come here. When I went over and saw, you know, spoke to, hey, Dad, he said, you always say you want to come live with me. Do you still want to come live with me? I said, yeah, Dad, I want to come live with you. Thinking to myself, well, here we go again. He said, get in, put me in the car, drove me to my foster home, was only a couple blocks away, walked in. He called my foster mother, Miss Beck. He said, Miss Beck, he said, I've come to talk to you. And she said, hi, Bill. What, what, what do you want to talk about? She said, I'm taking my son to live with me. My foster mother became hysterical. First, she couldn't believe what she was hearing. And then, because imagine, she's been caring for me since I was 14 months old. I was her baby. And she literally became hysterical. What, what, what do you mean? You can't do that. You can't, just, you can't just walk in here and just take him away. You can't do that. He said, Miss Beck, if I don't take my son now, we're going to lose him to the streets. He said, I've got to do it. She began to protest about the courts and the social services. And, and she said, well, at least give me, give me time to, to, to get ready, to pack his stuff up. He said, we don't have any more time. He said, I've got to do it. And my father told me, go get in the car. I walked out and got in the car. He left her in tears and drove me to his house and never looked back. I mean, just like that, I was removed from foster care. I don't know what the legalities were. I don't know what happened behind the scenes. But my father took me to his house, sat me down and told me, he said, now, son, you're with me now. And things are going to be different. He said, every day with me will be like a day of heaven on earth. He said, or every day I will tear your behind all to pieces. And it was legal then. And I found out he meant it. No more gang. No more staying out of school. No more committing petty crimes. I mean, my life literally changed overnight. I went from failing fifth grade and having a conference with my foster mother and my fifth grade teacher about whether I would be allowed to go on to sixth grade to being an A student in sixth grade under my father's tutelage. Well, just about a year and a half later, my father bought me a desk. And he said to me, son, I want you to work with your mind. He said, I work in the cold and the heat and the, and the rain and the snow. He said, and I leave my job filthy, dirty from the soot and the mess. He said, but I want you to do better in life. 
and I'm giving you this desk so that you can do your homework and you can work and, and, and have a place where you can study and, and grow and learn. And when people ask me, how in the world did you make it in the Harvard Law School? I said, I made it in the Harvard Law School, yes, by the grace of God, but because I had a daddy who never taught me that I couldn't, but taught me that I could and should, and that he was expecting great things of me and wouldn't accept anything less. So if you come in my house to take that desk, you better be prepared to fight for your life. Because the desk may not mean anything to someone else, but it means the world to me. Because it represents the change in my life that allowed me to become something far more than I would have had my father not intervened in my life. And my brothers, my sisters, I do not believe that God engineered me coming into a broken home or engineered putting me into foster care I believe God was the one who through the hand of my father rescued me from it and set me on a different trajectory for life. You see, God can't wait until everybody does everything right to work in our behalf because if he did, he wouldn't get anything done because most people aren't doing right. God has to work through the circumstances of our lives. Acts 17, 26 says this. He has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and determine their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they might seek the Lord. My brothers and sisters, if you believe that scripture, then you must know that just as God worked and engineered to give me the life that he had in mind for me, God has worked and engineered to put you in this place at this time to give you the life that he wants for you. If you believe the word of God, then you must know that based on that scripture, and hear me well, based on that scripture, if you've got Irish ancestry, you're not here because your family, your family came as a result of the potato famine. If you've got Italian ancestry, you're not here because the pogroms and the wars that were happening in what later came to be known as Italy and those, that, that, that boot, that, that place where people of Italian ancestry came from. If you have German ancestry, you're not here because of the wars that were taking place at that point in, in Prussia and surrounding areas that later would become what we know as modern Germany. If you're here, as a person of African ancestry, you are not here because of slavery. You are here because the hand of God worked to bring you here because this is where God wanted you to be. I've researched it. Find me a better place to live. Find me some place where you can say to God, God, you made a mistake. I would have been better off if my ancestors had remained in Ireland. I would be better off if my ancestors had remained in Italy. I would be better off if my ancestors had remained in Asia. Or if my ancestors had remained in Africa, I would be so much better off than I am today. Because it would be a lie. God blessed and gifted you to be in the freest, most prosperous nation the world has ever known. He may have gotten us here on different ships, but we're all in the same boat now. When I got saved, God spoke a couple things to me, but one of the things that God spoke to me that sort of changed my outlook was, he said to me, this country is my gift to you, and I expect you to be a steward of it. That's when the Lord ministered to me, son, you're not here by accident. You're not here because of slavery. Because those slave traders 
who got your ancestors from Africa and brought them here could not see you, but I saw you. And I saw all of those who were coming behind them. And I saw my plan unfolding for their lives. And therefore, I have placed you here for a purpose. Listen, you are here by the hand of God in this place at this time for his purpose. And God has given you the greatest nation on earth as a gift. And the question is, what will you do with the gift? What are you going to do with it? Are you going to abdicate your responsibility and walk away and say, well, my ancestors came as slaves, and so I, I don't, I, uh, America's not really my home. But if you're a Christian, go tell God that. Tell him how he failed you. Because if you believe Acts 17, 26, you know that you are here by the hand of Almighty God. And the question is now, what in the world are you going to do with what God has done for you? Where would you go to find a better life? Africa? Because I hope you know that Africa is in many cases a complete basket case. I mean, be between the Biafran War, what's going on in Ethiopia right now, the, the, the genocide that the Hutus committed against the Tutsis in Rwanda. In sub-Saharan Africa, one in 11 children dies before his fifth birthday. It has the highest infant mortality rate in the world. 59 million children between the ages of 5 and 17, while our kids are studying, they are working to try to keep their families alive. Where would you go? Western Europe? Western Europe has become completely godless. The things I said this morning and may say this afternoon in many countries in Western Europe, including Canada, would get me arrested, fined, and imprisoned. So where would you go? Asia? Slavery still practiced in India, China, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Uzbekistan, North Korea, the rest of the world never developed a moral polemic against the enslavement of other human beings. That happened in the United States of America and in Europe, but the rest of the world never rejected slavery as immoral. Islam still doesn't reject slavery as immoral. But this nation was founded on the principle we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's never been a nation like that. There's never been a nation that established the rights and freedom of the people on the basis of a grant from God, not man. Every other nation that's ever existed considered your rights and your freedoms something that human beings gave you. The king gave it to you. The dictator gave it to you. The legislator gave it to you. But this country was formed on the proposition that rights and freedoms come from God and what God has given, no government is allowed to take away. You and I are the only ones who understand this. You've got a whole slew of Americans of African descent who are living in resentment and bitterness and hatred of the country that God placed them in, and in a, as a result, they are completely uh, 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 ignoring the vast opportunity that is available to them. Not taking advantage of things that other people around the world look at with envy. I mean, in spite of all the polemic against our country, we've got a southern border overrun with people from 150 different countries trying to get here. Well, if America's so racist and America's so evil and America's so bad, why do those folks who say that go down to the border and say, hey, you don't want to come here? This is not the place. But you know what those people at the border would say? You're nuts. You leave. I want to come. Because they know they can live a better life here even as non-citizens. They can live a better life here than they can anywhere else in the world. 
The question is, what are we going to do with the gift that God has given us? Because I've said, when you are born a citizen of the United States of America, you have, in effect, hit the lottery. Here's some facts that a lot of people don't know for Americans of African ancestry. Somewhere between 10 and 12 million Africans left Africa in the diaspora and the Atlantic slave trade to be sent in other, to other, other parts of the world to work. Only 5% of those Africans came to this continent. 5%, 450,000, that's it. Most of them went to the West Indies, South America, of course some to Europe, but only a very small percentage came here. Why? Why were my ancestors chosen? You think it was the luck of the draw? No, the hand of God was working. And people say, well, slavery is America's original sin. That's a lie out of the pit of hell. I even have a senator in Virginia, Senator Tim Kaine, who said, America didn't inherit slavery. America invented slavery. And I thought to myself, here again, you got to raise his IQ 200 points just to get the dumb. <laughs> if you believe that. So my brothers and sisters, slavery, African slavery was started by Africans, not Europeans. And look, before the African slave trade started, the Barbary pirates who were Africans enslaved 1.5 million Europeans. They took their women and put them in harems. They, they bought they, pirating ships. They took the women and put them in harems, harems. They took the men and they put them to work as soldiers. And they had already been practicing enslavement of sub-Saharan Africans. And in fact, the Muslims developed a word called Abid, A-B-E-D, and that's a word that means both African and slave. When the Muslims took over and ruled the Iberian Peninsula, which we now call Spain, for 700 years, they brought Africans and introduced the Spanish to the black African as a worthy slave. This idea that is perpetrated on us we should be divided on the basis of race and that the racial problem is white folks. I say, how ignorant can you be? I mean, this is, a, this is a testament to how poorly our schools are educating people because, again, if they actually educated our young people to understand what's going on in the world, they would understand that slavery has been a universal institution that happened on every continent in the world, tribes enslaving other tribes, uh, 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 one group enslaving another group, one nation enslaving another nation. It's been the way of the world since the fall of man. And, and the African slave trade was the latest iteration of that. I mean, my goodness, didn't anybody see Spartacus? The Romans had a bunch of slaves who rebelled, and all the slaves were what we would call white. But the fact of the matter is, even this stuff of white this white stuff, that is a, that's a fairly new concept that was really started by the slave trade in order to convince all indentured servants from Europe that no matter how bad they had it, they didn't have it as bad as the Africans. And yet people have picked that up and perpetuated that as if there's some truth in it. And this notion that the whole, the problem with America is race. No, my brothers and sisters, it's not the skin, it's the sin. The Word of God teaches there is none righteous, no, not one. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The problem is not where your ancestors came from. The problem is not the complexion of your skin. The problem is the condition of the human heart. And listen, Every Christian ought to understand when we buy into this racial paradigm, we are committing a sin against God and we are violating God's word because we all have memorized 
2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone be in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. But very few know the verse that goes before it, which says, henceforth now know we no one according to the flesh, even though we once knew Christ according to the flesh, henceforth we know him thus no longer, which means that you've got no business evaluating people on the basis of their skin color, on the basis of what their flesh looks like. God says, I don't see as man sees. I look at the heart and not at the physical appearance. We ought to be conversed. We ought to be focused on character, not on the skin color of an individual. I can't stand this stuff. I want somebody who looks like me. I mean, how, how vacuous. How superficial can you be? I understand the history of the country. I understand there was once exclusion. But my goodness, just because somebody looks like you doesn't make them like you. Forgive this rather gross example, but the most prolific serial killer in the history of our country was a man named Sam Little and he was black. Is that what you mean? You want somebody who looks like you? How about somebody who thinks like me? Somebody who shares my values? Somebody who has my vision? Somebody who loves my God? See, we've allowed ourselves to be divided by the superficial, but the fact of the matter is we've been called to be one body in Christ. That's why the country is in such bad shape. You've got black Christians over here following this godless ideology. You've got what's so-called white Christians over here, whatever the Republican Party says. And by the way, and the Republican Party is not the answer either. The Democrats definitely aren't. The Republicans aren't either. Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him, there's none other. Jesus is the way. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God who is in all and over all and through all. And if you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and he's your Savior, that he died on the cross for your sins, that he rose again the third day, you are my brother, you are my sister. I don't care what your background is, what your ancestry is. We are one body in Jesus Christ and united with him by one spirit. For there is none other name given under heaven among men whereby we must be saved but the name of Jesus. And I've got news for you. Every eye will behold him, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that he's Lord to the glory of God the Father. And there's no black salvation or white salvation or brown salvation, Hispanic salvation, Asian salvation. There is one name given under heaven. That's it. That's all. And everybody's going to stand before him and give an account. Now look, we've got a problem in our country. A trick is being played on us. We are a nation built on the premise of individual liberty. Now, I realize the devil has played the trick of dividing us demographically and trying to make us be against one another on the basis of complexion and all this. Other things as well. I mean, look, I said, you, I, I just saw a documentary not too long ago in which a group of bloods had just had a row with some crips, and when they broke off from each other, the, the, the Crips wanting vengeance rode down the street and saw a young black guy, great student, athlete, not any part of a gang, but he was wearing blue. And they killed him for it. And I said, what's the difference between wanting to hurt somebody because of the color of their skin and wanting to hurt them because of the color of their clothes? See, it's the same sin. It's both equally absurd. Look, this is what human beings without God do. 
Because you know what, if God were to wave his hand over the whole earth right now and make us all the same complexion and give us all the same texture hair and he left one difference among us, some green eyes, some brown eyes, some blue eyes, some dark eyes, some light eyes, it wouldn't be long before the green-eyed folks would be saying, did you see the way those blue-eyed people looked at us? You know, they think they're better than we are. Because we're, human beings look for reasons to differentiate themselves from others and to, be, and to be hostile and suspicious of one another. But we are the body of Christ. Jesus didn't say, by your theological accuracy, will all men know that you are my disciples? By your encyclopedic knowledge of the Bible, by all know that you are my disciples. He said, by your love for one another. And we've got the, the nerve to let the devil divide us and not love one another based on the color of our skin or based on our denomination. See, it's time to reject that, that progressive collectivism. It's a Marxist idea. You know, there's not a single one of us who is going to stand before God with all of our Irish brothers and sisters. <laughs> there's no judgment for the Irish. There's going to be a judgment for you. There's no judgment for you all of African background. There's judgment for me and for, and for each of us. Each of us is going to stand before God to give an account for the deeds done in the body. Therefore, we ought to look at one another as individuals. You know, we, the, 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 the left in this country has completely thrown out Dr. King's principle that we want to judge one another not by the color of our skin, but by the content of our character. That's gone. Now skin color is everything, even when it's not an issue. These five black police officers killed Tyree Nichols. If you've seen the film, we're all convinced that what they did was wrong. And before you could even hear about the story, they're saying it was racist. So, well, how could it be racist? Well, because you see, black people are incapable of thinking for themselves, acting for themselves, deciding for themselves, and the only reason why they do things like that is white people taught them to. I mean, think about how, how first how stupid, but then how denigrating that is. Because what you're doing is you're removing from people any sense of moral agency and you're claiming that they're simply victims of the brainwashing of a, white, of a racist society. So, he, in fact, one guy said, I think it was uh, Van Jones, and somebody said, and you know what, if it had been a white guy, they wouldn't have beat him to death. I mean, just, we are so imbued with it. But we as the body of Christ have got to throw that mess off because there's no future in it for your children and grandchildren. I mean, tribalism doesn't work. And what the left is trying to do is to get us to be tribal. And what we ought to be doing is aiming to be one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. So this nation is like none other. If I would fight you for my desk because of who gave it to me. You better believe I'll fight you over this country because of who gave it to me. See, I see America as a gift from Almighty God, and I don't see my presence here as some kind of happenstance, but God put me here. And by the way, just as an academic exercise, let me make clear to all the people you might know who hate this country, because it's a free country, you may leave at any time. I don't, I don't have to be here. I can, I can renounce my citizenship if I want to, but I got news for you, I'm not going anywhere. I love this country, I am here to stay, and I want to pass on a legacy to my children of love for America and, a, and willingness to sacrifice to preserve the freedom that Almighty God has given us here. Jesus looked at Israel, said they were scattered as sheep without a shepherd. That's where we are right now. And he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones, those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. 
And I hear God saying to our country, America, America, how I want to gather you together under my wings as a chick gathers her brood, but you would not. And he goes on to say to them, see, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more. So you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And our prayer, if we love this country, we love our home, our prayer ought to be, oh God, don't leave the house of America desolate. Oh God, we gladly say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We don't want this atheist, secularist, Marxist, socialist nonsense in our country. Lord, we want you at the center of this nation. God is the single greatest value that built this nation. And Lord, we want you for our nation. You know, the Bible says that God told uh, 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 Abraham he would spare Lot. I mean, he would spare Sodom and Gomorrah if he could just find 10 righteous. Ultimately, he negotiated God down to 10 righteous. And when we think about our country and the people project projecting judgment, I, I remind you, there are millions across this country like us. Millions who love God, who love this country, who see this country as a gift of God. And I really do not believe that God is going to bring judgment on this nation as a nation as long as you and I, the righteous remnant, are here crying out to him saying, Oh God, have mercy. Give us time to turn our nation around. I believe that God is going to give us a third great awakening. And I believe we're already seeing the signs of that third great awakening happen. Now, of course, for those who say, now, Bishop Jackson, why don't you just stay out of politics? Because you're just, you're just getting into politics. I say, well, if you say that to me, and you're a child of God, and you're, you're going to heaven, when you get there, be sure to tell Moses, Moses, I was with you all the way until you started meddling in Egyptian politics. You should have just stayed out of that. But Moses went down to Egypt and told Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. Elijah, you were doing great as a prophet. Just mind your business. Why are you interfering with Ahab and Jezebel? God said to tell them that they were troubling the land and that God was going to judge them for it. And Nathan, you're a friend of David. Man, don't rock the boat. Don't point out David's sin. But Nathan went to his friend and told him that story about the one little ewe lamb that the rich man had stole from the poor man. And David said, where is that man? That man deserves to die. And the prophet pointed his finger at him and said, you are the man. That's not politics. It's prophetic ministry. Somebody's got to point the finger at Joe Biden and say, you are the man that is troubling America. And at Nancy Pelosi and say, you are the woman that is troubling America. And point the finger at Barack Obama and say, you are the man that is troubling America. And at a George Soros and say, you are the man that is troubling America. Glory to God. Glory to God. You know, Eli abdicated his responsibility to stand up against his own sons. And you remember what God said to him? God said, why do you honor your sons more than me? He said, why do you honor them and despise me? And you know, I, would, I really believe God is saying to many of these, these popcorn preaching pastors, yeah, these pulpit cowards, I believe God is saying to them, why do you honor being accepted and fitting in more than me? Why do you honor the tithe more than me? Why do you honor your family more than me? Why do you honor your tribe or your race or your ethnicity more than me? Why do you honor your church members more than me? Why do you honor land and buildings and media 
and the Democrat Party or the Republican Party more than me. God said, those who honor me, I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. It's time for us to stand up for Jesus and say, I'm going to honor God. I don't care what mama, daddy, sister, brother, black folk, white folk, Republicans, Democrats, I don't care what anybody says. I belong to him. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Glory to God. Glory to God. I feel like preaching in here right now. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry from the waters lifted me. Now safe am I. I'm not putting anybody before my Jesus. I owe everything to him, and I'm going to stand up to him until I breathe my final breath. Come on, guys, is that all you got? Let's give the Lord a hand tonight. Come on. <laughs> now you know why I was saying the men's meeting this morning had a little life in it. It was absolutely incredible. Go ahead and stay standing with me, if you will, tonight. I'm going to have the prayer team come on down here, if you're here. We're going to give him a little bit of time. He's going to head over here in just a moment, just outside of the, the atrium chapel out there in the bookstore. There we, uh, Bishop E.W. will be out there to, to sign books, interact with you, encourage him. Man, what a gift. I, you know, we just right now we just feel that the Lord, I, I was so encouraged. Ron and I both were just talking this afternoon. Just as us here as, as a church, the Lord's helping us. He's helping us. He's sending these voices that galvanize us to be confident with courage. You know, your, your courage is contagious. And man, God, thank you for this man. Well, as we come to a close tonight, if you need prayer for anything, anything, just to say, God, help me to be courageous like that guy. That's, a, that's enough. We'll pray for you. Maybe you have something going on in your life. Maybe you've got questions about Jesus and all the confusion that's happening. Let us interact with you. We'd love to pray for you. I just feel like we've just been washed today. We've just been washed by the spirit of truth. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord. We thank you for this man, his wife, his children, his grandchild. God, we thank you for him. We thank you for his church back home. We thank you for letting... Er, for them allowing him to get away for a weekend and come and bless us. We receive, Lord, all that you have in him for us. And God, we ask you tonight as we go, Lord, give us wisdom and courage and strength. Just that, that call to stand firm. Oh, we love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen and amen. God bless you, Grace Church. We'll be here again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. He's going to be giving a a brand new message. Again, get over there and get his book, whatever's left of him. God bless you.